All right, welcome back. Today we'll be talking about chapter 10 from the AMSCO A Push textbook, uh, focusing on Andrew Jackson um, and the time period of 1819 to 1840. Um, like we've done before, I will be taking um, some notes as we go. I've already got, I've got it set up, talking about new forms of democracy and then some key terms the election of 1824 with the corrupt bargain, the tariff of, of abominations, which leads to the nullification crisis, 1832. Uh, some key terms from Andrew Jackson, and then a new uh, uh, political party system, the Democrats versus the Whigs. Um, it's up to you which one you want to do first. If you want to uh, watch this video or read the chapter first, do whatever works best for you. Now, first in terms of, of democracy and what democracy means, or, or rather what, what democracy meant back then. Um, we know that there were different political parties in the early America, uh, George Washington, when he left in his farewell address, uh, he warned against political parties. He warned against division. Um, but right after George Washington stepped down, America was split into two political parties. The Federalists, which favored a strong central government, Hamilton Adams, and the Democratic Republicans, which focused more on states' rights, a weaker central government. Um, by 1820 or so, uh, the definition of what it means to be a Democrat is beginning to change. The old definition, this is sometimes called Jeffersonian democracy because Thomas Jefferson was kind of the, the, the molder of, of this political party. Uh, Jeffersonian democracy or Democratic Republicans um, believe that we should have a, a, a weakened central government. We should limit the power of the federal government. Um, and what's most important is individuals' rights and also states' rights. Thomas Jefferson, uh, Democratic Republicans, or Jeffersonian democracy, all about um, limiting the central government to protect states' rights. But Thomas Jefferson also believed um, that not every single individual should have the right to vote. Uh, he believed it was a civic duty for citizens to vote, but only property owners should vote. Um, this was a way for him to protect the, the power and the interests of the more wealthy. It says down here towards the bottom, uh, Thomas Jefferson believed that all men had the right to be informed, but leaders had to be highly educated. And so Thomas Jefferson, Jeffersonian democracy or the Democratic Republicans, they believed that only property owners and really only educated white wealthy men should have the vote. Again, most likely to protect his self-interests. By 1820, with the emergence of Andrew Jackson, comes a new definition of democracy, democracy sometimes called Jacksonian democracy, or the new Democrat, uh, Democratic Party. And what we see, the, the biggest difference that we see is we see the expanded suffrage. The vote is expanding. Now, uh, uh, property ownership is not a requirement to vote. And so essentially, most states allow all white men with or without property to vote. This changes things quite a bit because now uh, democracy is expected to serve all of the people, well, sorry, all of the white people, or sorry, all of the white men, because uh, it's not just property owners who have the vote. Um, Andrew Jackson was uh, all about, well, so he claimed being a man of the people, serving the people, a president for the masses. So he believed that all white men have the ability to lead regardless of, of how much education they received. Um, and then there's some other key terms that I'll talk about in a second there. So Jacksonian democracy, this is the idea that we should limit uh, federal government power. So we should have strong states rights and individual rights. But then he also believed that uh, only white property owners should vote. Jacksonian democracy, on the other hand, uh, we have expanded suffrage. Basically, all white men could vote. And so he believed, or, or rather an effect of this belief, is, is uh, the American government begins to serve the masses. Now, you'll see both of them were strict constructionists. They go to the letter of what the Constitution says. They're not looking at implied powers. Um, some other key terms associated with them, or sorry, associated with Jackson, manifest destiny that we'll explore a lot more later on in this course. The, the idea that the U.S. Was, was given by God the destiny to spread westward and to uh, colonize or settle in the western frontier. 
that'll lead to conflict with Native Americans. Um, and then patronage or the spoil system, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where basically Andrew Jackson would give uh, uh, government, governmental positions to his friends and supporters. Okay. Um, we talked in uh, a previous chapter about how um, the early 1800s were sometimes nicknamed the era of good feelings uh, because there was only one party, the Democratic Republicans, that ruled the entire time. But we know from previous chapters that this era of good feelings didn't last for very long. The Panic of 1819 was the first economic crisis that the U.S. had to face. That led to economic distress. And then the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which you might remember, admitted Missouri as a slave state, Maine as a free state, but prohibited slavery above the 3630 parallel. Uh, the Missouri Compromise kind of exposed that there were still lots of lingering conflicts, simmering conflicts just below the surface that were both conflicts over slavery, fears of slave states or free states having the majority, and then regional conflicts between the North and the South. So this era of good feelings is sometimes called the illusion of good feelings. It might have seemed nice and peaceful and tranquil on the surface, but there's all these tensions underneath the surface, economic tensions and regional tensions as well. Um, and so in 1824, this era of good feelings starts to fall apart um, as four Democrat Republicans run for president. And you can see they're, they're, they're scattered from throughout the United States. Uh, John Quincy Adams from the Old East in Massachusetts, uh, Henry Clay, founder of the American system uh, from Kentucky, the West, uh, Crawford from the Old South in Georgia, and then Andrew Jackson from Tennessee, or the New South, because Tennessee was, was a newly added state. Uh, let me move myself here so you can see the results. Uh, you can see with four people running, nobody won a majority. Nobody won a majority of either the popular vote or the electoral college vote. Um, and so the uh, uh, Constitution, or rather the, the 12th Amendment stated that if there is no clear electoral college winner, the House of Representatives would choose the winner from the top three candidates. Now, it just so happened that Henry Clay, fourth place, uh, he was the House uh, leader. He was the Speaker of the House. So he got to decide who was president. William H. Crawford had a stroke, so he was out of, uh, of contention. And so we were left with Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams, the top two vote getters. Um, now, shortly before the House of Representatives voted, um, there was a secret meeting between John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay, where um, uh, Henry Clay basically said, okay, I'll get the House to vote for you. I'll get the ho House to vote for John Quincy Adams. And uh, mysteriously or not so mysteriously enough, once John Quincy Adams became president, Henry Clay, Henry Clay became the Secretary of State. This is assumed to have been some backroom dealing where uh, Henry Clay told John Quincy Adams, hey, if you, uh, if you make me Secretary of State, I'll make you president. So again, this is called the corrupt bargain, uh, this kind of pay for play, if you will. <clears throat> so there is uh, no clear winner in 1824 election. And so then we have this, this uh, concept called the corrupt bargain where Henry Clay, makes John Quincy Adams president in exchange for being the Secretary of State. Not only is this super corrupt, I mean, it's literally called the corrupt bargain, um, but this also really, really angered uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, will eventually lead to a split in the Democratic-Republican Party. So it angers Jackson and it leads him to create his own political party. Uh, which were the Democrats, or sometimes called Jacksonian Democrats. So again, this, this corrupt bargain might have sounded like a great idea at the time, but it's really going to backfire. It's going to lead to the, the destruction of the Democratic-Republican Party. Uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, not much to talk about with him. Uh, um, he was Secretary of State under James Monroe. He's the one who wrote the Monroe Doctrine. He, he wrote that speech, um, but he was unsuccessful as president. I mean, only 32% of Americans, sorry, only 32% of voting Americans, so white property owners, uh, voted for him. Um, and there was increased sectionalism, increased regional conflict under his presidency. Um, for example, he tried to get the federal government to invest in roads and canals and universities to facilitate more trade, um, but that was very unpopular with the South, 
because they felt like the federal government was just helping the manufacturing centers and not helping them, and unpopular with workers um, who felt threatened by these new changes. Um, he also wanted to slow down Western expansion. He wanted to, to, to treat the natives fairly, um, whereas people in the South wanted to kick those natives out and take their land. Um, so lots of tensions uh, between John Quincy Adams and the South, especially, who was upset with him uh, from the South point of view of him being a little bit too easy uh, on the natives, uh, which, which, which affected the South kind of harshly in their opinion. We're going to focus much more on, on the election of 1828, though, and the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Um, at this point, the Democratic Republicans have split into two parties, um, what we sort of kind of know as the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, John Quincy Adams uh, runs for, for the National Republican Party. He's, he's labeled as an aristocrat and as corrupt, which, fair, he did have the corrupt bargain. Uh, and then uh, Andrew Jackson led the, Jack, led the Democratic Republicans, eventually just called the Democrats. And he uh, builds himself as a frontiersman. He was from uh, the, the uh, Western frontier from Tennessee, 95% sure, right? 95% sure I'm right that it's Tennessee. Uh, and he believed that he was a man of the people, that he would enact the will of the people. Um, now, this uh, election was uh, pretty brutal, pretty gruesome, lots of mudslinging, which means lots of personal attacks and exaggerations and, and uh, kind of digging up dirt on each other, uh, kind of like we see today, unfortunately. Um, and Andrew Jackson wins overwhelmingly. You can see he carried the South and the West because he was a man of the West, but he lost the old New England, um, kind of the, the merchant class. Okay, I'll add some notes here in a second. Don't worry, I just need, need to, to get us to the key parts of the story. Now, one of the, the big uh, early moments of Andrew Jackson's presidency was something called the Tariff of Abominations. If you call something an abomination, it's horrible, it's, 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 it's um, dreadful, it's the worst. And so there was a tariff passed in 1828. Um, let me just throw all of these notes up. Uh, there was a tariff passed in 1828 uh, that raised taxes on textiles, on cotton goods. Um, now, not surprisingly, this angered the South because cotton was king in the South. Um, now, tariffs are interesting because if you raise a, a tariff, uh, a tax on imports, a tax on goods from other countries, um, it's supposed to protect American industries because if I make British textiles more expensive, Americans are more likely to buy American textiles. The problem is it jacked prices up and then England would put tariffs on American goods and so there's, there's kind of a trade war. Um, and so what it actually led to is it led to higher prices on textiles, which means not as much business sometimes, and it led to less trade abroad, less trade with England and Europe. Um, so you can see here, New England and the middle colonies, they're happy because uh, they're able to, to profit off, off of this, these higher taxes. But the South is quite upset because uh, it leads to less trade, less profit for them with the textile trade. Um, and so as the U.S. continues to grow, as uh, westward expansion continues, as the South uh, kind of struggles to keep up, the North, we're going to learn, is going to be industrializing while the South is not. Lots of people in the South needed a scapegoat. They needed someone to blame. And many of them blamed the tariff of 1828 or the tariff of abominations. And they said, the reason why we're struggling is because of that tariff, because of those wealthy people up, up in the North who are, who, who are passing taxes affecting us. So when we talk about the tariff of abominations, we have the tariff of 1828 uh, placed uh, raised taxes on textiles. Uh, this angered the South because they have less profit, less trade with the tax. And many Southerners uh, blame the tariff for their woes, for their anger, for their anxiety. We'll get to this nullification crisis in a moment. Okay, I'm actually gonna skip Andrew Jackson for a minute. We'll come back to him because we'll talk about the nullification crisis right now. Um, to nullify something or to, to declare something null means to cancel it, to say it, it, it doesn't exist, it's not valid. And so South Carolina, Southern state, South Carolina said the tariff of 1828 or the tariff of abominations is unconstitutional, goes against the Constitution. 
And he incur, or sorry, not he, South Carolina encouraged other states to nullify or to cancel the tariff, which would mean the tariff wouldn't apply down there. Um, to kind of uh, uh, try to negotiate around this, the federal government passed a new tariff of 1832 that was better for the South, but it still had taxes on textiles, and so South Carolina was still upset. Um, so by 1832, we're in the presidency of Andrew Jackson now, uh, South Carolina declares the tariff of 1832, this new version of the tariff of abominations, null and void. They say, this tariff does not apply here. It's unconstitutional. We're not going to follow it. And not only that, if you all up, uh, up, up in Washington, if you don't um, get rid of the tariff, we're going to secede from the union. We will leave the union and create our own state. This is called the nullification crisis. South Carolina threatened to leave the Union, to secede from the Union, to leave the United States if this tariff was not removed. Um, now Andrew Jackson is going to send his army to South Carolina uh, to negotiate uh, uh, this. But this is um, kind of an early warning sign towards the Civil War of Southern states, South Carolina, saying, we will leave the Union if we do not get our way. And we see this continued tension between the North and the South over, uh, in this case, tariffs, laws, taxes. Uh, now, eventually, it's settled by the Compromise Tariff of 1833 by Henry Clay, the great compromiser uh, who, who helped write the Missouri Compromise back in 1820. He wrote the American, or created the American system as well. And um, the Compromise Tariff basically said um, that the president can use the army to collect tariff money. Now. South Carolina, they stepped off of the ledge. They promised not to secede from the Union. Um, but the tariff of 1828, tariff of abominations, and the nullification crisis kind of exposed that these regional conflicts between North and South, South still remained and are, frankly, kind of more intense than ever. So uh, let's see. In 1832, sorry, nullification crisis of 1832. Uh, is when South Carolina threatens to secede from the Union if the tariff is not repealed. And they declare the tariff null and void or unconstitutional. Again, this doesn't lead to any massive uh, uh, military conflicts at the time, but it kind of exposes the regional conflicts between North and South. That is really a running theme of, of the first half of this course. All right, back to Andrew Jackson. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of the highlights or really lowlights, frankly, of his presidency. Uh, you'll see 1829 to 1837. He's the first president from the West, first president from one of the new Western states of Tennessee. And he was really seen as the people's champion. He, he represented the masses. Um, and he won, frankly, because of the expanded white male suffrage, because most states did not require property ownership as, as, a, as a requirement to vote. Um, there was a story, and I, I didn't look it up, so I don't have all the details, but there was a, a, a day that Andrew Jackson had uh, once a year where he would uh, invite commoners into the White House, and he would have like hors d'oeuvres and snacks. I think he would have a big block of cheese in the middle of the White House. Um, and every day, commoners, peasants, working class could come to the White House, maybe not to talk to him necessarily, but to talk to one of his, his, his uh, uh, officials or representatives. And so Andrew Jackson really built himself as the people's champion, as the president for the masses, not just for the wealthy. And, or but, he also uh, uh, created a system called the spoils system. You might have heard the phrase to the victor go, the spoils. Andrew Jackson won, and so he rewarded his supporters, he rewarded his loyal supporters with political offices, with positions and titles. Now, the idea, to uh, quote uh, Donald Trump, was to drain the swamp, to get all of the old ideas out and get some new, fresh ideas in. But what the spoil system led to is it led to basically um, all that matters is are you loyal to the president? Are you loyal to Andrew Jackson? If you are, you'll get a nice, cushy, fancy, well-paying job. But loyalty wasn't to the Constitution anymore. Loyalty wasn't necessarily even to the people. It was to the president. So when we talk about Andrew Jackson, uh, so elected in 1828, he's the first president from the West. And he really uh, represented 
or he, he saw himself as the people's champion. So again, some key details here. He won because of the expanded suffrage. But he very quickly uh, kind of exposes some of his, his corruptions. So he has the spoil system where he rewards loyal supporters with uh, government jobs or government offices. Some of the other challenges of Andrew Jackson's presidency, obviously the, the nullification crisis, even though he represented the people, even though he, he won the Southern vote, quite a few conflicts with the South. Andrew Jackson is probably most, most famous or really most infamous for his conflict with Native Americans. Um, now, when George Washington was president and in his farewell address, George Washington set the precedent um, that we should deal with natives by signing formal treaties to acquire land. George Washington saw the natives as foreign nations, basically. And with any foreign nation, there are formal processes to go through, formal treaties and diplomats uh, to negotiate. The problem in Andrew Jackson's mind, however, though, is that the Americans were continuing to push west. After the Louisiana Purchase, after they gained all that land, the Americans are pushing west. He believed it was America's manifest destiny to push west. As they pushed west, they took more and more land, and they felt like the, the natives were simply standing in their way, I suppose. Um, there were, in the eyes of, of Andrew Jackson or in the eyes of Americans, there were five civilized tribes, if you will. Uh, there were the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles. Um, and in 1828, Georgia declared the Cherokee Nation illegal, and they took their land. Now, this went straight to the Supreme Court, Georgia versus the Cherokee Nation. Um, and the Supreme Court actually said, you know what? The Native Americans, Cherokee Nation, they're actually right. They have a right to this land, and Georgia is not allowed to take their land. Now, in the eyes of Andrew Jackson, remember, Andrew Jackson is, is a Westerner. He's a frontiersman. He's living on the, the Western frontier. He wants this land. And so Andrew Jackson says, okay, Supreme Court, uh, you've made your decision. Now enforce it. Literally says, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. And Andrew Jackson basically ignored the Supreme Court decision. And he said, and said you know what? Unless you're going to send troops to force me to uh, uh, respect their land, I'm going to take their land. And so this leads to um, two of the, uh, well, there's a lot of very dark moments in American history, but two of the darkest moments, uh, the Indian Removal Act and then the Trail of Tears. The Indian Re Removal Act of 1830, just one year into Jackson's presidency, uh, forcibly removed 100,000 Native Americans west of the Mississippi uh, to, quote unquote, Indian territory that would be, quote unquote, permanently theirs. Now. We can obviously um, guess that it's not going to be permanently Native American land as America continues to push west. The natives will just be pushed further and further off of their land into what we have today, them basically forced onto very small reservations. The Trail of Tears is the name for the basically forced death march, really, that these natives were forced upon uh, from their uh, um, historic homes the Seminoles in Florida, the Cherokees in Georgia, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, kind of in Mississippi, Alabama, um, and others forced to march across the Old South to these new Indian reservations. So I'm gonna kind of label this as, as conflict with natives uh, in general. First, we have the Georgia versus Cherokee Nation. Um, where Andrew Jackson basically ignores the Supreme Court and forces the Cherokee Nation or Cherokee tribe whoops, off of their land in Georgia. And then the, the more infamous um, terms, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 is when Jackson forcibly removes natives from their land. And then the Trail of Tears is their, their death march basically to their reservations. When we're talking about key terms to be familiar with the Indian Removal Act, absolutely the Trail of Tears, absolutely the spoil system. Uh, there's a lot in here that, that are pretty important. So I'll highlight some of those. Okay, approaching the end here, 
Um, Andrew Jackson was also against the National Bank. Um, remember, he's he's generally about about states' rights and a weakened central government. Although, what he's doing is really a strong central government. Uh, so Andrew Jackson vetoes an attempt to create a new bank of the United States in 1832. Um, in Andrew Jackson dies, the bank of the U.S. had become too powerful. It had become almost like a fourth branch of government, president, Congress, Supreme Court, and in his eyes, the bank. And in Andrew Jackson's eyes, the um, bank of the United States catered only to the wealthy, not to the people. Remember, he builds himself as a man of the people, the people's champion. Not only that, but the, the, the bank of the U.S. had forced a lot of Western farms to close because these farms couldn't get enough credit, couldn't get uh, a loan, or the interest rates were too high. And so um, Andrew Jackson uh, vetoed the Bank of the United States, canceled the Bank of the U.S. because he felt like it only catered to um, the wealthy, not to the people. <clears throat> um, now, this is important for two reasons. First, for the president, it's important because he is expanding his power. He's flexing his muscles. By Jackson using the veto, basically canceling out the vote of Congress, that expands the power of the president. The problem, though, is with no bank, remember, the bank provided uh, economic stability. It, provide, it, it prevented massive inflation. It uh, provided loans. It maintained a healthy, stable economy. With no bank, there's going to be another panic, another economic crisis, right when he leaves office in 1837. So let me throw this in real quick. Uh, so he vetoes, whoops, not with that in bold, vetoes the Bank of the U.S. Uh, the veto uh, um, expands the president's power, but it also leads to an economic crisis in 1837 uh, without a bank. The last thing to talk about with Andrew Jackson is a new two-party system. The old Democratic Republicans are basically gone, and so a new uh, two-party system emerges. The Democrats, Andrew Jackson's party, and the Whigs. The Democrats are all about states' rights. They're all about a weakened federal government, kind of like the Democratic Republicans. Again, I know it's, it, it, it sounds ironic, it sounds hypocritical that Andrew Jackson just vetoed a bank, and now he's saying we should have a, fe uh, a weak federal government. Um, but again, in his eyes, um, um, he used the veto to protect states' rights because he felt like the bank was, was, was getting too powerful. Again, it might seem a little hypocritical, but in his logic, he's trying to uh, weaken the power of the federal government. The new political party that emerges is the Whigs, modeled after uh, a, a British parliamentary party. Um, and the Whigs, they're, I guess, more like the Federalists, if you will. They want a strong federal government, and they want to follow the American system. The American system, you might remember, that was Henry Clay back in the Transportation Revolution. Um, the American system was a system of uh, railroads and canals and roads that connected uh, regions and states together, and that should be federally funded. Uh, they also wanted a strong federal bank, a strong national bank of the U.S. to provide loans and currency and, and, and maintain a stable economy. And they also wanted protective tariffs to protect domestic industries. All of this, again, is a strong federal government. Um, they also wanted some moral reforms, which we'll talk about when we get to chapter 11 next week, uh, including uh, beginning to argue for prohibition, getting rid of alcohol, and the abolition of slavery. Uh, you can probably guess, if you were to predict where the Whigs were most popular, you'd probably guess the North because not as much slavery up there. So well, sorry, no slavery up there. Um, so, so they'd be against uh, slavery. And the North would benefit from all of these, these transportation networks because it would increase trade. So again, this new political party system, um, we have uh, Jackson's Democrats. That is all about uh, weak federal government, strong states' rights. And then you have the Whigs. Uh, the Whigs want a strong federal government. They wanted an American system. Again, going back to Henry Clay's American system. Uh, that means federally funded roads and canals. They wanted tariffs. They wanted a bank. 
and they fought for certain reforms. Uh, abolition, prohibition. Prohibition, again, is, is going against alcohol, trying to ban alcohol. Uh, abolition is getting rid of slavery. And so as we review here, you can pause this to uh, jot down your notes if you need to. Oh, I don't need to be that big. Um, we see a new uh, version of, of uh, democracy with Andrew Jackson as the vote is expanded, as all white men get the vote. Um, American democracy begins to change. Now, we have the corrupt bargain where John Quincy Adams becomes president for four years, but that angers Jackson. That leads to the collapse of the Democratic Republican Party, and Andrew Jackson takes over. He sees himself as the people's champion, um, but really, I mean, the spoil system benefits himself using the veto uh, to get rid of the Bank of the U.S. That benefits himself. He also felt like he represented uh, uh, Westerners, tearsmen, kicking the natives off of their land to take it for um, uh, himself or, or, or for, for, for natives. Uh, sorry, for Westerners, my bad. Um, but again, we, we continue to see these, these regional conflicts, especially with the nullification crisis, conflicts between the North and the South. Um, and frankly, even with the, the, the new political party, the Democrats versus the Whigs, we're seeing those regional conflicts continuing um, that will eventually lead to civil war in about 30 or so years.